Now, Malachi chapter 3, the part that I want to focus on is beginning in verse 15. Great chapter, but beginning in verse number 15, the Bible reads, And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him. Now, now the phrase that I really want to focus in on is found in verse number 16, where the Bible reads, Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. Think about it. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. Now, the time that's being described here is very similar to the time that we're living in right now. This is shortly before Jesus Christ would come to this earth for the first time and be born of a virgin in Bethlehem. And uh, we're living, I believe, shortly before the second coming of Christ. I mean, we don't know when that's going to be. It could be 10 years from now, 20 years from now. 20. We don't know when it's going to be. Uh, we know it's not going to be today. We know it's not going to be tomorrow, right? But it's not going to be, it's, it could be sometime in the very near future. We don't know when it's going to be. We don't know the day nor the hour. But we are living in the days that will be known in the Bible as the last days, shortly before the second coming of Jesus Christ, which is similar to the days that were found before Jesus' first coming. And look what it says in verse 15. And now we call the proud happy, yea, they that work wickedness are set up. I mean, I'm talking about the most wicked and vile people who walk the face of this earth are the people who are lifted up today in America as heroes. I mean, I think of this uh, uh, basketball player. I think his name was Kobe Bryant. Is that right? Yes. And here's a guy who he plays basketball really well, but he's an adulterer. He's committing adultery with somebody that he didn't even know in a hotel room, some lady that's bringing him room service, and he's lifted up. And yet I can walk down the street today and go through the ghettos of America and see child after child and teenager after teenager wearing a jersey that says Kobe Bryant. Because he's lifted up as a hero. He's lifted up as an idol when he's an adulterer and he ought to be killed according to the Bible. Yes, that's right, whether you like it or not. Uh, the Bible says uh, that, that adultery is wicked in the sight of God. And in the old days, the adulterer and the adulteress will be stoned with stones. Okay. And so we see the most wicked and vile people are lifted up. I was sitting on an airplane and they were uh, flashing some kind of TV program. I look up and it's just all queers. Some guy wearing a pink shirt with his hair spiked and a limp wrist and, top, and everything. And he's lifted up. I'm not on TV this morning. I'm not lifted up this morning. Nobody in this room is lifted up on TV. I haven't seen your face on a billboard on the way to church this morning. Uh, because the most vile and wicked people uh, are being lifted up. And some of the best people in the world are in this room. And they're not lifted up. No, the vile and wicked are lifted up. It says, yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Then, they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. He said, well, what do you, what do you want to preach about that? Look, it's important for God's people to speak often one with another. See, this is part of what church is for. So that God's people can speak often one with another. He says, as a result in verse 18, Then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. Now turn to Hebrews chapter 10 if you would. Hebrews chapter number 10, very end of the New Testament. You see, a lot of people today have a hard time discerning between the righteous and the wicked. They have a difficult time telling the difference between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. But he says, if you'll speak often one to another, you'll be able to make that distinction. Look, if you would, at Hebrews 10.25, an extremely famous verse, but I want you to lay your eyes upon it. The Bible reads, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another... And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now look, what is the importance of church? You say, well, we come to church to listen to preaching. You don't have to come to church to listen to preaching. You could, you could listen to it on the internet. You could listen to a tape. You could listen to a CD. You, if you want, you can turn on the TV and listen to a bunch of heretics and weirdos. But the, the point of the matter is, going to church is not just to listen to preaching. You say, well, we go to church to sing the hymns. You can sing the hymns in your house. I sing them every day. I sing when I drive down the road. But you know what you come to church for is to speak with God's people. To assemble together with God's people. He said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. 
There's something important about getting together with other people who fear God, who love God, who serve God, and assembling with them and speaking to one another. Have you ever been to a church where people, they get out of the car, they walk into to church, they sit in the service, and as soon as the service is over, they're gone. You know what I'm talking about? I've been to whole churches like that, where everybody just, the parking lot fills up, you know, right when it's going to start, everybody walks in, sits down, the service begins, the sermon ends, and everybody's gone. Now, is that what God wants, according to the Bible here? No. He said, they that fear the Lord should speak often one to another. You see, everybody speaks to somebody. Everybody pretty much has friends, pretty much, I guess, you know. Everybody has friends that you talk to, Right? You have people that you might talk to on the phone. You have people maybe that you go out to lunch with or go out to dinner with or spend time talking with and uh, fellowshipping with. Who should it be that you spend time with and talk with, according to the Bible? Those that fear the Lord. Those that fear God. You should be able to see the difference between somebody who fears the Lord and does not fear the Lord. You should be able to see the difference between the righteous and the wicked. And I'm going to tell you something. Nothing almost can be more important in your life than who your friends are. I mean, it could make all the difference in the world. I preached about this several weeks ago when I preached the sermon about thou shalt prophesy with them. About Samuel going to the company of the prophets and sending his servants on before him. And they prophesied with them just because they were there. You see, there are people who would never be a soul winner, but if they came to this church, they'd be a soul winner. It's true. I mean, we've had visitors show up, never been soul winning, never thought of soul winning, Came from the morning service as a visitor. We had a soul winning that afternoon. And I asked, I asked one lady, I said, did you ever think you'd be out soul winning this afternoon? She said, no. I said, is this what you thought you were going to do when you woke up this morning? No. Nope. But when you come to Faith Forward Baptist Church, you just end up going out soul winning, it seems like. But what, you, what I'm trying to say is, those same people in other environments would not be out soul winning. Some of the people here that go soul winning in another environment would maybe not be soul winning. Okay, I, I had a burning desire to win souls since I was a little kid, since I got saved as a six-year-old boy. But I never won souls until I got into soul winning church when I was 17 years old. I never won anybody to Christ. Why? Because who your friends are, who you spend time with, who you speak with is going to have a great deal of influence on who you are. And that's why it's so important for the people who fear the Lord to speak often one with another. Not to show up for church just on Sunday morning and then just maybe uh, blow in, blow out, not talk to anybody. You need that Christian fellowship. You need to spend time with God's people, encouraging one another. And as the Bible says in, in verse 25, here, exhorting one another. And by the way, he says, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We live in a day where we have less church than ever. Churches are cutting out their evening services. They're throwing out Sunday night and Wednesday night. Now tell me something. In 2008, according to the Bible, do we need more church or less church? If anything, we need more. Because he says, you're going to need more assembling of yourself together as you see the day approaching. Because as the world gets more and more wicked, you're going to need more and more to get around God's people, talk to them, fellowship with them. Because the whole rest of the week, you're talking to the world. You're listening to the world. You've got to come to church and talk with God's people. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. And, you know, I hope, I hope that you don't look at church as a place where you just come and listen. I mean, if we wanted to, we could set up a turnstile at the front door, and you could throw in a few quarters, and, and cha-ching, and walk in, and sit down and enjoy the show. You know, we could start selling popcorn and sodas and everything. And you could sit down and relax and watch church and listen to church. And you know, that's what most churches are becoming anyway. Like, they don't even put a songbook in your hand these days. Maybe they'll sing a token congregational song. Maybe if you're lucky, you'll sing two verses of two songs. And the rest of it is sitting down and watching some performer get up and perform. Watching some singer get up and sing a solo, sing a duet, sing a quartet, sing the choir. Look. Church is not something that you watch. Church is something that you participate in. Right. You come to church, and this is where it starts. You speak one to another. You say hi to people. You, you're friendly to people. You talk with people. You, th these are your friends. Not just people that go to the same church. These are your friends. It's your family. These are your brothers and sisters in Christ. You come to church, and you talk with God's people. 
Then the service begins. You take a songbook and you sing the songs. You don't listen to people sing. You don't sit back and watch people sing. You sing the songs. You say, well, you're the song leader. I don't have a microphone. Did you notice that? I have no microphone. I have no sound system. I have no speakers. There's no reason in the world why you can't sing just as loud as me. Right? I mean, I don't, I don't have some kind of superhuman voice. And so I'm up here just to wave my hands around and do the, you know, down, in, out, up. Down, in, out, up. But your job is to sing just as loud as I'm singing. And when I was in the pew, I used to try to see how loud I could sing. I would try to out-sing everybody around me. But if you notice this, when you walk into a church and nobody's singing out, I don't even sing out. I mean, I've walked into a church where people are not singing out loud. And I start singing, Blessed is the church. Sure, Jesus. Oh, the poor taste of the Lord. You don't want to sing out really loud if nobody else is singing out loud, right? But see, this church ought to be a place where people sing out loud. Right? Where everybody's participating. Where everybody comes in, everybody grabs a songbook, and everybody sings out and makes a joyful noise unto the Lord, and sing to the Lord with all your might. That's what kind of church this ought to be. So number one, it starts when you get here. You speak often one to another, as it said in Malachi chapter 3. Secondly, you get here, you, you get the songbook, and you sing out. You sing loudly. You, you participate in the singing. And boy, there's nothing better than a church where everybody's singing out loud. I mean, that's a powerful thing. And I, I'm going to tell you something. I can't wait to get to heaven and to get up in heaven and to sing with all of God's people who've been saved throughout all the ages. I mean, can you imagine how great that's going to be? I mean, I love... I, sometimes I've had a chance to go to a big church, a big church where everybody sings. Some big churches, you know, people don't really sing that loud. But in a big church where everybody's singing at the top of their lungs... It is a very powerful experience. And can you imagine when we get to heaven? Millions and millions of people strong. The General Assembly, the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and we're all going to be singing out the hymns, Jesus Christ himself being the song leader. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? How good that's going to be? But you see, when you come to church, you speak often one to another, you, you sing out the songs, and then, you know, during the preaching, you know, you're listening, you're, 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 and you know, you're turning in your Bible to the Scriptures. That's a good way to participate during the, the preaching. You know, turn in your Bibles. Be here to learn. Don't just glaze over and just think about where are we going to go to lunch today? Is it going to be Arby's? Is it going to be Long John's? Is it going to be Chipotle? Is it going to be this? You know, focus on what we're doing. And then when the, when the service is over, we sing another song, sing it out, and then when we're done... You don't have to run a race to your car. <laughs> you have to just like, Jesus name, amen. Bam! You're gone. <laughs> like, you know, smoke's coming up. You're peeling out of the parking lot. God forbid you talk to somebody. God forbid you get to know somebody. Hey, they that feared the Lord, the Bible says, speak often one to another. And by the way, the best friends you're ever going to find are you're going to find in this room right here. Or you're going to find in a church like this. That's the best friend you're ever going to find. See, the world's friendship is not like the friendship of God's people. It just isn't. Reminds me of uh, Samson in the book of Judges. He had a, you know, his best man at his wedding. It said he was a guy that he used as his friend. You know what I mean? And that's what some people do in the world. They use people as their friend. And a lot of, have you ever heard of fair weather friends? You know, and a lot of, a lot of your friends in this world are fair weather friends. Because as soon as you get in need, as soon as, you, as soon as you don't have any money anymore, as soon as you don't have anything to offer anymore, as soon as you're not fun anymore, they'll be gone. Because they're just using you as their friend. And, and the Bible says that people would use you as your friend. That's what Samson did. But see, we ought to be speaking often one to another as God's people according to the Bible. Look down at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. The Bible says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what comfort hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now look at verse 14 again. Be ye not unequally yoked together 
with unbelievers. Of course, the most common application here, which is definitely important, is you don't want to be married to an unbeliever. You know, if you're already married to an unbeliever, you're supposed to stay with them. You're supposed to uh, raise the children in a godly way. Don't depart from your husband if you're wife, and don't divorce your, your wife, and all these different things. But he says, you know, if you're single, you ought not be married to an unbeliever. You should only be equally yoked with somebody who's believing. But he, but he gives a reason why. He says, for what fellowship had righteousness with unrighteousness? Now, fellowship is talking about something that they have in common. Fellow interests. Fellow beliefs. Fellowship is not just meaning that you're getting together and, and spending time with someone. Fellowship means that you have something in common with someone. That's what fellowship means. He said, what fellowship is there between righteousness and unjust righteousness? What communion had light with darkness? Can the two mix? I mean, can you really mix light with darkness? No. As soon as light appears, darkness is gone. Darkness is the absence of light. And so you can't mix light and darkness. There's no communion. There's no connection between light and darkness. He says, and what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And the word infidel just means they don't believe. Fidel is a word that has to do with faith and believing. And so he's saying, what part does somebody have that believes with somebody who doesn't believe? And he says, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of God, the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now listen to me. If you, if you can sit there and say, well, I have a lot more in common with people out there, you know, in the world, and unbelievers, unsaved people. I just have so much more in common with unsaved people, and I just can't find anything in common with the people at church. You know what you're saying? I'm, I'm unspiritual. I'm worldly. I'm not right with God. I don't love God. God is not uh, my life. I mean, soul winning is not my life. I'm not filled with the Holy Spirit. I just go to church, and that's about it. That's what you're saying. I mean, if you can't relate to people who are believers more than you relate to your unbelieving friends, then there's something wrong with you spiritually. And that's a fact. You say, well, you know, I just have so much more in common with the world. You ought not have so much in common with the world. You ought not be so much like the world. You say, oh, but we enjoy the same uh, recreation and pass it. Is that what your life is about? Is that the biggest part of your life? I mean, look, I have recreation and pastimes. You know, when I grew up, I had certain hobbies. I have hobbies right now. And you know what? One of my hobbies now is traveling. I love to travel. I love to study foreign languages. I love to read books. I love to read history. I do. But you know what? I have so much more in common sitting down with somebody who's a born-again, Bible-believing Christian than I would with somebody who loves history or somebody who loves traveling or somebody who loves foreign languages. You know, I could probably enjoy talking to that person for a couple hours, but that's not going to be my best buddy because, to be honest with you, I have so little in common with them. Because my recreation and my fun is not 90% of my life. Okay? My life revolves around the Bible, soul winning, church, preaching. I could get around people, and, and this is interesting. You'll get around people that if it wasn't for the fact that you're saved and they're saved, you would never normally be friends with this type of person. You know what I'm talking about? Like when I was growing up in school, you'd gravitate towards certain people that are like you. And then there are other people that were dramatically unlike you, and you would not get around those people as much, because you're going to, you know, water seeks its own level, birds of a feather flock together, you tell a man who boozes by the company he chooses, and on and on. But anyway, uh, you know, people tend to gravitate toward people that are like them. But it's amazing how, once I started living for God, you know, I've been saved since I was six, but I wasn't really doing much for God until I was 16, 17 years old. Once I started living for God, I found that I could get along very well with people who I normally would have had nothing in common with. Normally, they would have people, been the people that I did not gravitate toward in school growing up. But because we were both saved, we just all of a sudden had so much in common. And it was amazing. I mean, people that I would normally never be friends with these type of people, but because we both loved the King James Bible and the soul winning, all of a sudden we had way more in common than the, me and the other people around me. And I started gravitating toward a whole new crowd of friends. Because my life is not about what type of music I listen to. I don't listen to any music, by the way. But if I did, that wouldn't be what my life is defined by. Who are you, Stephen Anderson? Oh, I'm rock and roll. I'm hip-hop. I'm country. But that's some people's identity in this world. Who are you? Oh, I'm a skater. Oh, I'm a skier. I'm a snowboarder. You know, and by the way, I'm a skier and not a snowboarder. 
And then, no, that's a whole other story. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, the point is, and, and by the way, there's only two types of people in this world. Skiers and snowboarders, and the plants are never eat. All right? And you're, you're either one or the other, and don't be a compromiser and say you like both. But the, po the point that I'm trying to make is, that's not how I define myself. I'm not going to say, oh, you're a Roman Catholic snowboarder? I mean, you're, you're, you're a Roman Catholic skier? I'll take the independent Baptist snowboarder. I'll suck it up and hang around with some independent fundamental Baptist, even if they do snowboard, okay? Because that's not the most important thing in this world. What's the most important thing in this world is your religion. Are you listening to me? It's what you believe. It's who you are, spiritually, for all of eternity. That's what really matters, not what you look like. Well, I hang around with people who look like me. I hang around with people who talk like me, who act like me. No, I hang around with people who believe like me. That ought to be who I talk to the most. But it didn't say, the they that feared the Lord spake often with all their worldly friends. And every once in a while, once a week, they got together with them that feared the Lord and passed a few uh, just casual words. No, I want to be close friends with the people in church. And I want to be acquaintances with the people that are outside church. I want to be close friends with other believers who maybe don't go to this church, but they're, they're like-minded believers. I want to be close friends with them, and I want to be a casual acquaintance with the world. I'm not going to be a casual acquaintance with the people at church and close friends with those on the job, close friends with my sporting buddies, close friends with my traveling buddies, close friends with everybody out there. I want to be close friends with God's people because that's who I'm going to spend all eternity with. You say, well, wait a minute. I have this really close friend that, that is not a believer. What do I do? Get them saved. Get them saved. You say, well, they won't get saved. Well, keep preaching the gospel to them until they say, get away from me. And then your problem is solved. You think, your, you think your unbelieving, ungodly friend is going to want to hang around with you when all you talk about is the Bible, Jesus, soul winning, church? Yeah, get away from me. Unsaved people don't want to hear that because they, they can't find fellowship with that. They don't have any concord with that. They can't have communion with that. You understand what I'm saying? And so what you believe is what should define who you are. Who, you, who you're going to be for this little tiny stretch of your life is not as important as who you're going to be for all eternity with Jesus Christ in heaven. That's what ought to matter to you the most. And so if you find yourself gravitating toward unbelievers, gravitating toward people that are worldly, just, just mark it down. You are not right with God. And you ought to work on yourself spiritually. I'm not saying you're not saved, but you ought to get in the Bible, read it, study it, meditate on it, get out of soul winning until you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's what you want to talk about. And that's who you want to be around. That's the truth. But turn, if you would, to uh, 2 Samuel chapter number 13. Second Samuel chapter number 13. You see, I, I would define myself most by the church that I attend. That would be my biggest, if I wanted to define myself, I'd define it by the church that I go to. Not as much by the job that I have, not as much by the town that I live in. It's more about where I go to church. You know where you know where I and by the way, I'm I'm not one of these people that moves around a lot, and I don't I hate moving around a lot, and I don't think it's good to move around a lot. And uh, I'm gonna tell you something. But whenever I've moved, it was only because of church. It's the only time I've ever moved. You know what I'm saying? Like, I grew up, I was born and raised in Sacramento, California. That's where I lived. And uh, I wasn't moving until I moved to go to church somewhere. And then the only other time I've moved, I'm, I'm not talking about moving around within a city. I'm talking about a major move, like a change of, of geography. And then the only other time I moved was to come here to start this church. And you know when the next time I'm going to move is going to be? Never. When I'm dead, they're going to move me. You know, they're going to pick me up and move me somewhere. I, you know, I'll be down. I don't know where that's going to be because I'm not even going to be alive. But I'll be alive in heaven, that is. But my body will be dead. But what I'm trying to say is my decisions in life are based on church, the Bible, Christianity. That's, that's who I am. If I had to define myself in, in a few words, it would be Baptist. That's who I am. King James Bible. That's who I am. I'm, you know, I'm a believer. That's who I am. I'm not going to sit there and define myself well. Uh, I love long walks and, you know, the outdoors. And I love, uh, I lo you know, I'm, uh, well, I'm, I'm 5 foot 11 inches tall. And, you know, I weigh 175 pounds. And I'm brown hair, brown eyes. And, no, I'll define myself like this. I'm a Baptist. I believe the King James Bible is the word of God. I'm a soul winner. That is, uh, there we go. I just define myself. And, and you know what? That's who I am. Okay? And so you ought to be able to, to think about your, your friends and say, why do I love being around people who are against the Bible? Maybe my love is not right. 
But look at look at the danger of hanging around with the wrong friends. Look at 2 Samuel 13, 1. Because we're, we're talking about the positive of man. Get around God's people. Get around good friends. Get to know the people that are in our church. Be their friend. Be there when... You say, well, the people at church aren't friendly to me. Well, look, the Bible says a man that has... Look, this is a mean church. No, this is a very friendly church. But the Bible says a man that has friends must show himself friendly. So why don't you reach out to somebody and be their friend? Why don't you be there when they need you, help them, do something for them, and then you'll have a friend when you reach out to them and, and do something kind for them. Sometimes you have to take the first step toward friendship. But look at 2 Samuel 13, 1. It says, And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar, his half-sister. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon was so vexed that he felt sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin, and Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend, whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimeat, David's brother, and Jonadab was a very subtle man. And he said to him, Why art thou, being the king's son, leaning from day to day? Wilt thou not tell me? And Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. And Jonadab said unto him, Lay thee down on thy bed, and make thyself sick. And when thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come, and give me meat, and dress the meat in my sight, that I may see it, and eat it in her hand. And I'm not going to read the whole story for the sake of time. But we see here that David's son Amnon had a wicked thought in his mind. He had this wicked idea of, boy, I love my half-sister Tamar. Okay? And obviously that was a wicked thought. I mean, there's a lot of fish in the sea, Amnon. You know, uh, your half-sister is not one of them. Okay? And so, you got all these other women that you... I mean, you don't think this guy could have found pretty much any woman that he wanted because he's the king's son. He's a pretty eligible bachelor. He's got money, probably a good-looking guy. He can pretty much have whatever he wanted. But the wickedness of his heart made him desire the one thing that was off-limits, which is his half-sister. And he had decided in his mind, you know, this is what my thoughts are, but it's, it's wicked, it's wrong, I shouldn't be doing this. And so he said, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to restrain myself here, and I'm not going to do it. But then look at the words in verse number three. But, see, he'd, he'd already decided in verse two, I'm not going to do it, but Amnon had a friend. You see that? But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea. David's brother, and Jonadab, was a very subtle man. And so this wicked friend talks him into doing something vile and wicked. I mean, we're talking about something, uh, rape is what he committed. Incest. These are things that the Bible punishes with the death penalty. And later, guess what? He gets a death penalty from his own brother Absalom, who slays him in revenge for the wicked thing that he's done. And so we see here a man who had decided, I better not do that, but he gets around his friend, and his wicked friend talks him into doing it. And then later on, if you read the story, I don't have time, his wicked friend then tells on him and explains to the, the David, oh, this is what happened, you know, Amnon forced Tamar and this and that. And so uh, the same guy who's egging him on later on is, oh man, you know, look what you did. Look at the wicked things that you've done. That's Jonathan, which I believe is a picture of the devil. The devil will tempt you into doing things. Then he'll try to make you feel guilty about it for the rest of your life. The devil will try to accuse you and make you feel guilty about the thing that he tempted you to do in the first place. He's playing both sides here to try to ruin your life. And so you ought to be careful to get the Jonadabs out of your life. You may have a friend like Jonadab. He needs to go. Oh, I've been friends with Jonadab for years. Jonadab is going to get you into sin. Because one day, it's going to be just you and Jonadab, and Jonadab's going to say, come on, just do it, no big deal. He's going to talk to you and do it. You're going to have a weak moment, and you're going to commit wicked sin that will ruin your life. It killed him here. And you see, many times, we, we get around people that would cause us to sin, when in reality, if we had good Christian friends, let's say we had a weak moment, and we're thinking about doing something that's wrong, they would, they would rein us in and say, hey, wait a minute, maybe we shouldn't do this, right? Because all of us are going to have a weak moment where we consider doing something sinful, but if we have that friend there that's going to say, no, wait a minute, let's think about this, and rein us in and say, let's reconsider here whether we want to actually do this. But if you have some wicked, unbelieving friend, like a John and Dad, He's just going to egg you on in your moment of weakness and push you into sin. I mean, that's what it says. 
And so we have to be very careful about it. And here's a good saying that I heard one time. The saying is this. You are right now, or you soon shall be what your friends are. I mean, if I want to know your future, I can just look at your friends. Because eventually, they will rub off on you. It's the truth. I mean, I'm telling you what. When I get around a guy from work, and I'll work with different people. Sometimes I'll go through a phase where I'll work with this person for a few months. I'll get in a phase where I'll work around this. I will begin to talk like that person. And I'm a pretty dominant personality, would you say? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a very dominant personality. I'm a leader. But still, when I get around somebody for months on end, I will begin to talk like that person, act like that person, and be like that person. No matter who you are, it's the case. They will rub off on you. I mean, my wife says sometimes that I act just like my boss, because I'll talk to my boss all the time. And she'll say, oh, you sound like Tim, you know, or, or you sound like so-and-so. Because I'll get around those people and talk to them all the time, and I will begin to be like them in certain ways. They will begin to be like me in certain ways. And we rub off one on the other. And that's a fact. You can, you can deny that and say, oh, no, I know who I am. I know what I am. You'll start to pick up expressions from them. You'll pick up mannerisms from them. You'll begin to act like... I mean, pe people who go to this church kind of act like me in a way sometimes. And, and people who go to this... I act like them sometimes. I mean, it's just you rub off on each other. It's true. I mean, I, somebody came to this church and talked to somebody, uh, and they said, man, the people in your church remind me of you, is what they said. I said, well, yeah, you know, these are my friends. I mean, this is my church. These are my brethren here. And so, yeah, of course they're going to act like me. Of course, I'm going to act like them. I'm sure I pick up things from them. The point is that if you get around friends, just look at your friends and say, is this who I want to be like? And if you look at that friend and say, I would never want to be like them, then why are you hanging around them? Because you will begin to be like them. Amnon became like John a dad. He, I mean, look, he had a great dad. David was a great dad, godly man. But his friend ruined it and got him uh, living an ungodly life. Look, if you would, at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. You say, well, I don't agree with this sermon. Well, then go ahead and keep hanging around with your ungodly, worldly friends, and, and we'll hear about you, including the church. We'll hear about you. And, and you know what? The people who never... The people who never fully get plugged in at church are the ones who usually quit the church. You know what I mean? The people who never get fully on board with our church. They're not out soul winning. They're not fellowshipping. They're, not, they're the ones who are going to be gone. Because they, they, because they never... Do uh, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, they never uh, became friends with this church. And you see, many churches... I've even heard uh, pastors get up and, and, and really discourage... The people in church from being friends with one another. Seriously. I mean, I've heard them discourage it and say, you know, you don't want to get too close with anybody in the church. You, know, you want to keep it on a very professional level, I've heard them say. You know, keep people at an arm's length. Keep it professional. Keep your distance. You don't want to develop these real close relationships at church because what they're afraid of is they're afraid of gossiping or intriguing or they're afraid of people uh, scheming and getting together and talking bad about people and all that stuff. And look, is it right to talk bad about people? No. Is it right to be scheming and intriguing each other? No. But, let's not throw off the baby with the bathwater. If we're not supposed to be close to people in church, why did Paul say, greet all the brethren with the holy kiss? Now, I'm not going to kiss any of the brethren here this morning, but I'm, I'm going to tell you something. That denotes closeness. You know, it's a different culture, and that's not our culture, and that's never going to be our culture. Uh, it's the United States of America. Deal with it. And so, but I'm going to tell you something. That denotes closeness, doesn't it? I mean, he's saying, greet the brethren with a holy kiss. He's saying, closeness, affection. And so I'm not going to sit here and say, well, you know, ladies, don't get together outside of church because you're going to talk and gossip. And Look, I'm not, your, I'm not your dad. I'm not your mom. I'm not going to sit here and make rules so that you don't gossip. Or, you know, that's between you and God. If you want to go around and, and run your mouth and, and, and hurt other people, you know, that's between you and God. I don't care. That's not my business. I'm not going to try to police you. I'm going to tell you something. You ought to be close with people in this church. You ought to be friends with people at church. I'm not going to say that you should keep people in arm's length. You should not keep people in arm's length. This should be your closest inner circle of friends right here in church. 
Look at Acts 2.42. Let me turn there myself, but Acts chapter 2, verse 42. The Bible reads, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now look, you can see people here getting together throughout the week, eating a meal together, spending time together, being close friends with one another. That's what we see here in the early church. We see people who loved each other. They were friends with each other. They would go out to eat with one another. They would spend time with one another. These were their closest friends, those who were together with them in the house of God. That's what I believe. And so my, you say, who are your friends, Pastor Andrew? Look, you're looking, these are my friends. Right here. This church, this is my closest friends. This is my closest circle right here. And you know what? My other friends, I can list off several of my other close friends. I'll tell you something about all my other close friends. They're all independent, fundamental, King James Bible only, soul winning Baptists. And they're all men, by the way. Okay? Except for family, that is. Uh, I don't go around having a bunch of female friends because I don't think that's right either. You know, my female, I got my female friend back there and that's the one that I've limited myself to. I'm not going to sit there and go out to lunch with, with some other lady and do all this. Stuff. I don't believe that's right. But I'm going to tell you something. They're independent, fundamental Baptists. And, you know, even among my family, you want to know which of my relatives I speak to the most? It's the ones that are soul winning, independent, fundamental Baptists, King James only, Christians like I am. You say, why is that? Because it's just a natural thing that that's who I'm going to gravitate toward. You say, did you decide to do that? I don't even know if I consciously decided to do that or if I just gravitated toward the people that are like me. And I found myself clashing with the people that are not like me. Because I just realized there's no fellowship with light and darkness. You know, there's just no concord with Christ and Belial. There's just no communion between me and somebody who doesn't believe on Jesus Christ. I have a hard time Find things in common. He said, you can only talk about skiing for so long. You can only talk about history for so long. You can only talk about traveling for so long. I mean, it's fun. You know, I'll get on the airplane with people. And I'll get on a three, four hour flight. And boy, we'll talk. You know, it's me and some unbeliever, I'm saying. Me and some unbeliever will talk and talk and talk for a couple hours. You know, and then I'll give them the gospel and, and, and go through my salvation with them. And maybe they get saved. Usually they don't. Sometimes they do. But I go through the whole thing with them really clearly. Most of the time they don't get saved. Sometimes they do get saved. But then at the end of it all, really, if I were to get together with that person again, we probably wouldn't have much to talk about the second time. You know, the first time there's a lot to talk about. But I'm sorry, it's going to get boring after a while just talking about those things. Because it's just not my life. It's just not who I am. It's a very small part of who I am. And so I can talk to them for a few hours. But I really don't have any desire to continue the friendship after that. That's pretty much it. You know, if they were to get saved and, and in church and stuff, then we'd probably have a lot in common. Say, so why is it that most of the people that you talk to on the airplane don't get saved? Because broad is the way that leads to the destruction of many of the people which go in there at. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to the life of few that we defined it, number one. Number two, a lot of people aren't going to get saved the first time they hear the gospel. Sometimes it's got to be watered and, and harvested. And number three, the reason that we have so many more people saved outdoor or soul winning than I do on the airplane talking to the people that are with me. It's because when I go door to door soul winning, I go through like 50 doors. Not interested, not interested, not interested, not interested. And then I get to the one that wants to get saved. That'll, well, sure, tell me all about it. And that's the one who gets saved. But I don't sit next to 50 people on the airplane. I don't walk up and down the plane and say, you know, hi, you know, Pastor Steve Anderson, you know, uh, sure, the Pastor seatbelt lights on, it's perfect, you know, no, just a minute, I'm doing a little soul winning, you know, sir, we're trying to get the beverage cart by, you know, I'm only sitting by one or two people, and so I've only got one or two shots at it, so, you know, at least I've got a captive audience, that's nice, you know, well, we're, you're stuck with me for the next four and a half hours, I remember one time, one time my sister and I, my younger sister, we were flying somewhere, and we get on the plane and we were seated separate from one another. So I told my sister, I said, here's what we're going to do. As soon as we got on the plane, we're going to start talking to each other really loud. And, and somebody's going to offer it a switch. You know? <laughs> hey, Lisa, you know, so we're talking real loud. And usually somebody's like, would you like to trade seats? You know? <laughs> and, then, uh, and then, you know, they say, uh, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. 
I can see that you're traveling together. Would you like to sit by her? We could trade you. So then uh, me and my sister, and I told her, I said, then plan B. Plan B is I'm just going to start giving people the gospel. And then they're going to ask to switch. You know, after we've yelled together. Yeah. So then I gave, gave this guy the gospel. He didn't get saved. And then he's like, so would you like to switch? I saw that you're with your sister, you know. Yeah, great. Sure, thanks. And then I got to sit by my sister. And so, you know, people, sometimes they just want to kind of just, oh, you know. But, but when you got that captive audience, it's a great opportunity to give somebody the gospel. Because, you know, you're going to be stuck. The next four hours, unless they go out the emergency exit or something, you know, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a good solid four hours with them to give them the gospel and explain it to them. And so, uh, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with the sermon. But where was I in my notes here? The Bible says this: that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Proverbs 18.24, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. You know, you'll find in your life that sometimes the people who stick closest to you are not always going to be your family. Did you hear that? Not always. Sometimes you'll be able to, uh, and, and you know, if you have a friend in your life that will stick closer to you than your brother, you know, you ought to, you ought to be loyal to that friend. Take care of that friend because it's a rare thing to come by. But sometimes even when your family forsakes you, your friends can be there for you. But that's why you don't have the right kind of friends. And if you show yourself friendly, you'll have friends. And he says, you know, there is a type of friend. There is a friend that's taken close to the brother. And then obviously also the illusion there is, is insinuating Jesus Christ. He's our friend, you know, and he is closer, will stick closer than a brother. Jesus Christ. But I think that the primary application here is saying, look, there are friends that can be close to you. Then a brother. The Bible says a, a friend that is near is better than a brother that's afar off. And so friends should be an important part of your life. See, oh, I, don't, I just don't have friends. Look, God says he wants you to have friends. It should be a part of your life. Fellowship. Friends. A church. A group of people. Why? Because Proverbs 27, 17 says, Iron sharpeneth iron. So a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. You see, that's why the Bible said, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as a man of some is, but exhorting one another. You say, what does that mean, exhorting one another? He said, don't forsake the assembly, but exhort one another. Exhort, number one, exhort people to be in church. Now, I'm not saying to rebuke them. I'm not saying to call them up and say, where were you? Get, get, don't miss again. Sick of this. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying exhorting one another as in... Hey, let me show you how to exhort somebody to go to church. Exhortation is kind of been, it's more of an encouragement. Okay. Exhorting one another would be like, hey, you coming to church tonight? You know, just like, like, man, you could be at church, right? Like you want to see them there. Or hey, I missed your church, you know. And, and really, I don't, I, you shouldn't even bring up when people miss church. In fact, I wouldn't even say that. Hey, we missed church. Because you know what? I'm going to tell you something. Some churches... It's like you, you miss for a couple weeks. And I, I've never been one to miss church. I mean, I've gone to church since I was born. I went to the services, whatever my parents went to. And the, the longest I've ever gone without going to church was 20 days. When I was extremely sick and in bed, I missed, you know, two Sundays and a couple Wednesdays. And so it was, it was 20 days of being out of church because I missed two Sundays in a row. So it was, you know, almost three weeks later. That I got to, so, I mean, I've never been one that missed church. But, you know, when people miss church sometimes, they'll be out of church and then they get back. Where have you been? <laughs> what happened? Okay, that's going to make people apprehensive about coming back to church. Because what happens, this is what happens. People will miss church for a few weeks, are you listening? And then they're embarrassed to come back. I mean, this is, trust me, this is a big phenomenon. You know, I've, I've seen this in a lot of churches where somebody will miss church for a couple weeks, then they're embarrassed to come back because they don't want to face everybody saying like, where have you been? Oh, I've just been backslidden. How you doing? You know I, mean? I just quit church for a while because I just got, I just not right with God. How are you doing? It's a dumb question to ask because, you know what I'm saying? It ought to be when somebody is gone for years and they show up, it should just be like, hey, great to see you. How you been doing? You know, shouldn't even mention the absence. It, encourage, just, man, you're here tonight. It's going to be great. You know, we're having some ice cream after the service. Maybe we can go out to dinner or something. You know, encouraging, yes, but not rebuking and ripping on people for not going to church. I mean, I just talked to somebody recently 
who left the church because they got tired of every time they would miss a Sunday, they'd come back and the pastor would come and be like, is everything okay? I mean, is, are you doing all right? I mean, you need to talk to me about anything? And, and, and the, this girl is just, leave me alone. You know what I mean? Just mind your own business, right? And look, people's business is their own business when it comes to that. You're not, you, you, or, or another, another thing, you know, part of the family will come to church and it's always, where's your wife? Where's your husband? Where's your kids? You know? And then, it, again, it's negative. You're, you're, you're criticizing them, ripping on them. Look, you ought to be friendly to them and just say, hey, it's good that you're here. Great to see you. You know, and not always bring up the people that are not there. Be excited about the people that are there. You see what I'm saying? And, you know what? Be more uh, exhorting as in, hey, man, you, the Wednesday night's been great. We're going to do this. It's going to be this. Come on. Hey, you come to the picnic. It's going to be a blast. It's going to be fun. Uh, but we're going to do this. I hope you're there. Man, it's not going to be the same without you. You know, that's the kind of positive encouragement that can exhort people to not forsake the assembly of themselves. Yet make people want to come to church and not be afraid to come back because they don't want to face everybody. You know, and you say, well, they shouldn't be prideful like that. They should just face up to it. Well, but look, maybe they shouldn't be prideful like that, but they are. You know, people are, and people don't like that. Nobody likes to have somebody get in their face and ask them where they've been. And so don't try to be the attendance police or something. You know, if people have gone for a while and they come back, just pretend like they're never gone. You know, just take out of And by the way, let me say this. Since we finally don't have any visitors, you know, I always want to say things like this, but it seems like we have visitors every week, every week, every week, visitors. But every service, visitors, visitors, visitors. I can never say it. But this week, we don't have any visitors. I don't count the Colby's as visitors because they've been here like, what, 12, 13, 14 times now. And so they're, they're part of the group here. But, but let me say this. When we have visitors, and maybe I'm just kind of pausing the sermon, but not really because this has to do with speaking off one to another. When visitors come to church, please, I want everybody to make an effort to be friendly to that visitor. That is so important. I mean, don't you remember what it was like when you first came to a church that you weren't familiar with? You're embarrassed. Now, look, I'm by nature a very outgoing person. I'm not a shy person. And yet, I can remember every time I tried a new church, I was always nervous. Even the, the outgoing person that I am, whenever I walked in, I was uncomfortable. I felt like everybody is, is just looking at me and, and I don't know where to sit. I don't know what to do. It's nerve-wracking. See, oh, where are all these people you went to the Lord? I don't see them in church. Good night. Not everybody's willing to just get in the car and drive to a church they've never been to, where they don't know anybody, and just walk in. They don't know what's going to happen. Especially some people who've never even been to church. They don't know if somebody's going to make them get on their knees like in the Catholic church and <laughs> sprinkle water and poop with dust and, and do all this kind of stuff. They don't know what's going to happen. I mean, look, this is maybe, the, I, hope, I hope I'm okay for telling this story, but uh, <laughs> my... This guy, I'm not going to name who it was, okay? But this is a, a relative of mine, a distant relative. He got saved, right? And he was going to get baptized. And the pastor, my wife's laughing because she knows where I'm going. He's going to get baptized. And so the pastor told him over the, you know, he called the pastor and said, you know, I want to get baptized sin. And uh, the pastor told him, well, just bring a change of underwear. Okay. Now, listen. He called up another family member of mine and said, are they going to baptize me in my underwear? Because <laughs> he didn't realize that they have a, you know, that there's a baptismal robe, like provided by the church, so that you don't get your clothes wet. You know, they give you like a, a waterproof clothes to put on, so that you can get baptized in clothes. And the only thing you needed to bring was, you know, change my underwear. And he said, uh, "What is going on?" <laughs> and so that's just to show you things that we take for granted that are obvious to us. People who are out in the world, you know what their idea of church is? All the mockery that they've seen on TV, making fun of church and making fun of religion, making Christianity look like a bunch of kooks and weirdos. And so they think they're getting baptized in their underwear or something. And so what I'm trying to say is, you, you ought to be very friendly and reach out to people that come here as a visitor. And by the way, just because someone brings a visitor, doesn't mean that you don't have to be friendly to them. Because a lot of times the tendency is, that what will happen is somebody will bring their friend to church and will just say, oh, that person's with Dave, you know, that's his friend, he'll be friendly to him, you know. No, if somebody brings a visitor, you should still go and approach that person. And not even just an obligatory, hi, how you doing, good to meet you, bye. But maybe actually strike up a conversation with that person. Maybe even say, hi, where are you from, you know, what do you do? And, and get to know people. 
Be friendly to them. And I want this church to be a friendly church. It ought to be, according to the Bible, a friendly church. It ought to be a church where people speak to one another and are friendly with one another. And when somebody walks in as a visitor and everybody's looking at them but not talking to them, that doesn't make them feel comfortable at all. And I'm going to tell you something. I've walked into a church before and I didn't even much like the church. But I walked in. I had people walking up to me saying hi. A guy took me and said, here, let me introduce you to some people. Let me introduce you. And he was introducing me to people that were my age and friends. And I was getting to meet all these friends. People were giving me their email address, their phone number, saying like, hey, you know, let's get together later this week. And even though there were a lot of things I didn't really like about the church, I continued to go there because of the way that I was treated. I thought, wow, these are some great friends. And I kept going back just for the friends. Oh, that's not why you should pick a church. I know. That's not how I pick a church. I don't think you should pick a church based on that. But people do. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, people that are new believers and that are weak spiritually, that is going to determine their determination. And just because they're weak now, look, be their friend. That will make them want to come back. And by coming back and hearing the preaching and going out so many, then they will grow and be strong. And then they will never pick a church based on that again. You understand what I'm saying? But well, you've got to reach out to these visitors. You've got to be friendly to them. You've got to talk to them. Get to know them. You say, well, I'm shy. Well, change. Get some, pray for boldness. And go to people and talk to them and reach out and be a friend to them. And that will change our church. I'm telling you. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not ripping on our church because our church is good about this. But there's definitely room for improvement. You know what I'm saying? Some people are better about this than others. And all of us could do better about it. All of us could improve on this. And do a better job of being friendly. And you know what else makes an impression on visitors? Singing loudly, like we talked about earlier. Sing it like you mean it. Sing it like you want to be here. And you know what? You ought to want to be here anyway. And you ought to want to sing these songs. You say, well, I'm shy. I'm embarrassed. Well, if you've been to the last 24 weeks of Isaiah, every single week was about pride. Get the pride out of your heart. Say, I sing terribly. Sing anyway. Quit being prideful. Just sing it out no matter what you sound like. Nobody's going to care. We're not all homing in on your voice. Oh, man. Can you believe how she is saying? Oh, man. Oh, man, listen to him. He can't carry two in the bucket. Oh, good night. Who is that? Nobody cares. I mean, do you ever sit and think about how other people are saying during congregation? Nobody does. Everybody's just thinking about how am I sounding, you know? Or, and they're all singing out and wondering how they themselves are sounding. Sing it out. Get rid of your pride. You say, well, I'm embarrassed to go talk to somebody. I'm afraid I'm going to look like an idiot. That's pride, again. Come out of your comfort zone, humble yourself, and walk up to the visitor and be friendly to them and reach out to them. Walk up to that person who's not a visitor, who's been a member of our church for a long time that you don't know, and get to know that person. Speak often with them. Make a new friend today and get to know people in this church. This church should be your inner circle of friends. I believe that. Because if this church isn't your inner circle of friends, your inner circle is going to be the world, and you're going to go the way of the world. Because you're going to, I mean, you're going to get your friendship somewhere. You're going to get your social interaction somewhere. I don't know about you, I'm going to get it here. I'm going to get it with these people right here. I'm not going to go out there and, and find a bunch of people that I have nothing in common with. You know, you hear about young people that date unbelievers. And they'll date them for a year. They'll date them for a year and a half. What do you talk about with them? Obviously not God, obviously not Jesus, obviously not the Bible. Hey, get right with God. Be filled with the Spirit. And you're not filled with the Spirit if you can talk about everything else all day. If you're filled with the Spirit, you're going to talk about the things of God. That's going to be, you'll talk about other things sometime, but your biggest focus. What, what, don't be a fly on the wall in my house. You know what my wife and I talk about? The Bible, church, soul winning. Because that's what our life is about. And that ought to be the focus of your life. Christ who is our life. Bible says in Colossians chapter 3. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the church that we had here, dear God, and our friends. And I pray that you would help everyone here to take advantage of the, of the friends that they have here and get to know them and, and reach out to them, God. And help us to reach out to visitors and reach out to those who are, who are new to our church and let them know that we love them and that we're, we're here to be their friend. And help us to abstain from the wrong friends, dear God. And, and, uh, Maybe then we can not have our lives ruined by a John and Dad. And we love you and thank you so much for uh, dying on the cross for our sins and for uh, being raised again for our justification. That we could have this bond one with another of being uh, in the brotherhood of believers. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
All right, let's go ahead and sing. Uh...